welcome to the Space Policy Show. I'm Colleen Stover from the Aerospace Corporation. As we inch closer to episode 100, I'm very pleased to welcome Lieutenant General Stephen Whiting to the show. He serves as the first commander of US Space Force's Space Operations Command that was redesignated from the Air Force to the Space Force in October 2020. From cyber and intelligence to partnerships and workforce development, innovation through a digitized service, Lieutenant General Whiting leads this force readiness efforts at Space Force. The general will be talking to aerospace expert Leslie Blackham, the principal director of our Space Enterprise and Warfighting Division. And I know Leslie has some great questions lined up. Leslie? Well, General Whiting, welcome and thank you so much for joining us on the Space and Policy Show. Uh, my pleasure, Leslie. Thank you for inviting me. I, I look forward to the discussion today. Me too. So, so let's jump right in. The, the first question that I have for you is, you know, the Space Force is a new service. And so as the Space Operations Commander, um, your new command is going to turn two this October. So as the first SPOT Commander, um, the acronym for Space Operations Command, you and your staff are really creating the foundation for SPOT going forward in achieving its mission to generate, present, and sustain forces for US Space Command. What progress do you feel that, you, that your team and you have made in achieving that vision and advancing your vision overall? Yeah, thanks for that question. It really has been an amazing two and a half years uh, since uh, the Space Force was stood up and, and Space Operations Command was created in October of 2020 uh, as the first of the Space Force's three field commands, our version of a major command. Of course, we're the Operational Fight Tonight Command. And that first year was really all about getting organized and starting to implement our new organizational structure. Shortly before Spock was created, uh, we had stood up our Space Deltas, which is our 06 level of command, our basic warfighting organizations. And, uh, and it's all been about making sure that they're empowered to get after their mission. And we're really proud of how they've done that. But during that first year, we completely reorganized our headquarters. Of course, we were built from the legacy Air Force Space Command staff, but we got much smaller with a more focused mission on fight tonight operations. And so our headquarters now looks nothing like uh, it used to under Air Force Space Command. Um, we also, in that first year, were helping Space Training and Readiness Command stand up. We executed most of their missions for the most of that first year. But in August of 2021, we helped Starcom stand up and then Space Systems Command stood up and we gave them the launch mission. So that year one was all about really getting organized and, and operating this new structure that is so much leaner than uh, the Air Force structure we inherited. And then in year two, um, we said we got down to our fighting weight, much like a UFC fighter, and we've really been focused on core operational tasks, integrating intelligence, cyber, and operations. Uh, we're doing things like uh, right now in the midst of bringing on the Navy and the Army satellite communication mission. Uh, a month ago, uh, I was out at Point Magoo, California at the Naval base there as the Naval Satellite Operations Center or NAVSOC transferred all of the Navy's narrowband SATCOM uh, capabilities and, and satellites to the U.S. Space Force. And in August, we'll do the same thing with the U.S. Army when they give us all of their capabilities uh, in the SATCOM arena. Um, so for the first time in history of uh, DOD, we'll have one service responsible for all satellite communications. So uh, we're really excited about that, excited about getting after uh, all of these warfighting tasks, making sure that we are ready as a nation to face the threats that we now see in the space domain. So I, I, you know, I have to tell you, I spent decades of my Air Force career supporting MILSATCOM. I helped build MILSTARS and supported Advanced HF and spent seven years sitting at Schriever in the MILSATCOM doing ops and sustainment. So when I saw the, the movement of the Navy over and the movement of the Army over at a personal level for me, that was really exciting because I, I am, you know, I'm thrilled that we're starting to get that, that center of mass really for the MILSATCOM community. It, it's been, you know, that it's in a community that works well together, but to see them all in one Delta will be really exciting, I think, for everybody involved in SATCOM for the joint forces. 
yeah, I completely agree, Leslie. And as an experienced person, as you just laid out your background, uh, as I was there helping to transfer uh, the Navy mission, young Captain Whiting in 1997 and 1998, I was flying the Navy ultra high frequency follow on satellites that we call UFO. Yep. And some of those satellites that I helped launch are still executing mission for the nation, doing great work 25 years later. So it was really kind of cool to see those satellites that I had commanded uh, so many years ago. And, and just for your audience's interest, uh, in the very near future, imminently, we are about to uh, uh, change out command of Delta-8, which is our SATCOM and, and precision navigation and timing Delta. We've had a fantastic commander, Colonel Matt Holston. Well, we're about to get another fantastic uh, commander, Colonel Dave Pheasant, who just transferred from the U.S. Army into the U.S. Space Force. So starting to see uh, guardians whose background came from the Navy, the Marines, or the Army taking leadership positions in our Space Force, and we're very excited about that. Uh, that, that, is, that is tremendously exciting. It's really showing the Space Force as a joint force, and it always has been. All the, the space capabilities have always really contributed to the joint fight, but to hear that, um, that, that is really exciting. I didn't recognize the name when I saw the announcement, and so now I understand why I just wasn't familiar with his name, so I appreciate that very much. Thank you. So, so in the recent past, and you just mentioned this in your introduction, you've been focusing heavily on cyber integration, um, you know, with space squadrons and deltas making certain that, that given the threats to our ground and to our space segments of the national space infrastructure, you know, making certain that, that the squadrons and deltas are prepared for that. What about intelligence integration? Are you looking at that as well? Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, our, our core competencies in SPOC are fourfold and in, in no particular order, it's intelligence, cyber, space operations and combat support. And the way we pull all of those together is in our number one priority that we've published. And that, uh, that priority reads as follows, and we've selected these words very carefully. We say that we prepare combat ready, intelligence led or ISR led, cyber secure space and combat support forces. So everything we do has to be relative to the threat. In fact, the threat is the reason we have a U.S. Space Force and a U.S. Space Command today is to have a service and a combatant command focused on preparing our forces to, to operate in the face of those threats. And so I've been really proud of Space Delta 7, which is our ISR Delta. In fact, I regularly say the areas that I think we're making the most progress in uh, from, from where we were when we were uh, not a Space Force yet is intelligence and cyber. So Space Delta 7 does a number of, of critical things for us. Uh, one which I, I think you and, and your audience would be interested in is they have a squadron who, who their job is to present delta, uh, del debts, excuse me, present detachments to each of the other space deltas to provide them intelligence tailored for that other delta's mission right into their ops floor. So if you are at Space Delta 4, our missile warning delta at Buckley, your intelligence comes to you as a detachment of Space Delta 7. That detachment commander, typically a major, works day to day for that supported Delta commander, making sure that he or she has the intelligence that is needed to enable that mission. So again, at Space Delta 4, all of that intel is about missile warning, missile defense, and the threats to those systems. So we're very proud of, of how we've organized and we're really seeing great benefit to that. But Space Delta 7 does so many other things for us as well, as well. It deploys units around the world and has detachments around the world that are doing important collection um, uh, operations. Um, it's executing Title 50 authorities uh, on behalf of the Space Force. And, and soon, as we build out three more squadrons over the, the next couple of years, it will be executing the complete uh, TPED uh, cycle, the tasking, uh, processing, exploitation, and uh, dissemination um, cycle of intelligence. And it's all focused on space. And now that we have a Space Force, those Intel guardians will spend their whole career just focused on space threats instead of bouncing in and out and going and doing other things like they used to have to do in their, in their previous services. So really excited about where we're headed in intelligence and we feel like it's an area we're making great progress. So I, you know, thank you so much for, for delving into the details of how the detachments will be um, connected to how the Delta seven detachments will be connected to the other deltas I know, you know, from my experience sitting at Shriver, as well as experience I had on the acquisition side, collecting space intelligence on 
from a space perspective is something that in the past was not a primary mission. And so we would we would bring people on board into the Intel world and fire hose them. And then right when they really started contributing hugely, we they would have to move on to something else as part of their Air Force career. And so I, I'm certain for the guardians that are doing that, it, it will be a, a, an incredible change. And, and you already have awesome intelligence guardians. I've worked with some of them closely and to know that they're gonna have an opportunity to grow their career in that way is, is just really exciting. And so, you know, I, I, I can't, you know, I, in the way that you're organizing the SPOC, uh, it, it really makes sense to me that, that that's a focus for the Deltas and, and I can see how the new squadrons will really advance that mission. So very yeah. exciting. It is. And, and, you know, we had great airmen that would come and do fantastic uh, assignments with us. And then, as you said, they might, you know, typically go do another uh, Air Force assignment. They might come back at some point or they might not. But now we're growing that expertise and we're partnering Intel with operations. And that includes cyber, where now over the course of a career, a young guardian, uh, they will get to know, uh, you know, if they're an operator or cyber specialist, they'll get to know their Intel counterparts, and they'll grow up together. Uh, and in fact, we talk about a left seat, right seat model, where when our space operators or cyber operators are executing mission, there's an Intel operator uh, sitting right next to them, bringing them that Intel that they need. And they're just going to grow up together, and, and they're going to figure out new ways of operating that I, I think are going to be eye-watering as we move forward. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that evolves, and, and I'm sure our audience will be as well. So thank you. Um, so along those lines, and I think this is a big part of why you're you're wanting to bring the intelligence community more and uh, more tightly couple it with the operational community, is the fact that the guardians right now are, are are facing the challenge of you need to be developing operational concepts for space in in a world in which it, you know I. Uh, conflict could extend in the space, but there's really no historical experience on how will you do that and, and what are the ways that you would work in a, a contested domain. How do you see the Space Force adapting to be successful in future conflicts that might extend into, into space? And, and how do you see them adapting into working more in a more integrated fashion with the joint force? Yeah, that is a really uh, dense pack question. And if I don't yeah, I touch on all the uh, facets of it, please uh, hit me up on a, on a, a comeback question. But yep. again, this is why we have a Space Force and a Space Command today is to focus on this very issue of how do we prepare uh, for a fight that could uh, start in or extend in space. And by doing so that uh, we deter that from happening. And, uh, you know, it, it cuts across every facet of our service. So, you know, this is why we're talking about building more resilient architectures today. And, and General Raymond has created an organization, the Space Warfighting Analysis Center, whose job is to do force design. And so now we don't look at one-off missions like SATCOM or PNT or Space Domain Awareness and go just focus on that. We're always thinking about as we do a force design, how does it fit into the broader architecture? And then from that, the, that force design, we derive requirements that then we move, move out to start developing and acquiring systems through our acquisition arms. So all of that is elevating uh, now as we speak. Uh, we've created Space Training and Readiness Command, which I, I highlighted earlier. Uh, their job is to train the guardians that are going to be the ones figuring this out for us. Uh, it's to also develop the tactics, techniques, and procedures with our new capabilities and our, our legacy capabilities to be successful in the face of these threats. Space Training and Readiness Command is developing the testing enterprise that we need to test our systems and our TTPs uh, in a threat representative environment against aggressors who play the red adversary uh, so that we know we're going to be successful. Um, modeling and sim is a key part of this. Our domain space is, is completely well suited for outstanding modeling and sim for us to train in, to evaluate our processes in. So all of this is being elevated as we speak. And then in, in Spock, uh, we are working to, to think about ourselves in a, in a force package environment. And what I mean by that is we can't just execute one mission alone. We have to bring together all of our capabilities, whether that's high value assets, command and control, intelligence, cyber, uh, offense, defense, joint fires, bring all of that together to execute our mission successfully in the face of these threats. So uh, this is what we're working to do across our entire service to, to elevate our game and make sure uh, we are ready uh, if that day is called, uh, you know, we're called upon 
and, and a war does extend into space. And of course, we don't want that to happen. Well, certainly that that is it's good news to hear all all the activities that Spock is doing and Starcom are doing to prepare for that that potential and also to deter the possibility that that would happen. And certainly I know that's a major portion of the Spock's mission is the deterrence aspect. And so that but but as we all know, deterrence can only go so far and and being prepared in case it's insufficient it is the reason we have the military that we do. And so I, you know, I thank you for having that vision and for coordinating with with the other field commands as they've stood up. It's it's a it's an exciting time, but it's also a, a little bit of a um, it, it can be an unsettling time when you think about how peaceful space has been and and what are the changes that, that could happen. Um, so we, yeah. we appreciate that. Yeah. Well, thank you. In, in, in many ways, it's back to the future. Um, you know, I wasn't alive in 1957 when Sputnik was launched, but but I've read about that time period, and I know it was a existential moment for the United States that we lost the opening rounds of the space race. The Soviets had had beat us to space, and in very yeah. quick fashion, they launched the first animal. They launched the first uh, I'm sorry, the first man-made object, Sputnik, the first animal, uh, the first man, the first woman. Um, and and I think there was yeah. a confidence, uh, a crisis of confidence in the United States. Like, has the Soviet system beat us? Um, and then, of course, over the next 10 to 12 years, we, we won the closing chapters of the space race when Neil Armstrong walked out onto the lunar surface. But that was all birthed in competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. And throughout the Cold War, we know the, the Soviets were fielding operational ASAT systems. But then when the, when the Cold War ended and the wall fell down uh, from the, the early 1990s and, until 2007, when the Chinese uh, tested that uh, that ASAT, that uh, yep. one of their own satellites. You know, we really did go through about a 17-year period where where space was benign. But since 2007, certainly those of us in uniform have known about the threats. And now, over the last several years, uh, the, you know, I think the whole uh, body politic has become aware of that. And again, that's why we have a space force and uh, U.S. Space Command today. So we're we're relearning many of those lessons of the past about competition and uh, and the competitive nature of space. No, that 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 is so true, and I, I I really appreciate your perspective, and I'm sure our, our audience will as well. So so we talked about the the contested aspect of space. There's been a lot of discussion over the next the, or the last decade about space becoming increasingly congested, contested, and competitive. Um, from a more I think congested perspective and competitive perspective, where do you think we'll see space in a decade? I mean, there have been huge growth explosive even in the commercial activities. How do you think that will impact the Department of Defense and the SPOX mission when it comes to space? Yeah, a, a few statistics which will help uh, your audience understand how much space is growing as a congested environment. If you go back to the beginning of 2001, so 18 months ago, we've already seen a 40 plus percent increase in the number of trackable objects on orbit. If you go back to the beginning of 2020, uh, two and a half years, that number's over 80%. So that's being caused by a few things. One, uh, the uh, reckless, destructive Russian ASAT test in November of last year, where they shot one of their own satellites, creating about 1,500 pieces of long-lived debris. Uh, we've seen mega constellations growing now. Uh, that's adding to the number of active payloads on orbit. And then we've deployed some better sensors, which are allowing us to, to track uh, you know, ever smaller uh, pieces of debris. But anyway, we're tracking about 46,000 objects on orbit uh, right now. And again, that number's rapidly in, in increasing. So that just sets the context for, for the following answer. You asked about, uh, you know, how can we leverage commercial industry? Uh, you know, if the first golden age of space was when Neil Armstrong and, uh, and Apollo 11 landed on the moon, we are certainly in a second golden age of space today. And that is being led by commercial industry. It is incredible what American and Western companies are doing, and we want to leverage that capability. And of course, we want American and Western companies to continue to be the world's leaders in, uh, in space development, space exploration, and, and using space for, for all sorts of missions. And, and we absolutely want to uh, continue to leverage that capability. We do have a history of leveraging uh, commercial capabilities like uh, satellite communications, which historically 80% of what the Department of Defense has used has been commercial, but there's other missions that we can continue to leverage that uh, going forward. And then you asked about 
where might we be in 10 years? And, and I'm reminded of a, a law, I think it's called Amara's Law, that says that uh, in the short term, we tend to overestimate the impact of technology. We hear about something new and within a year it hasn't transformed the world. And then we get, you know, I think they call that the valley of disappointment or something like that, that, oh, yeah. that didn't play out the way I expected. But over longer scales, five to 10 years, we underestimate the impact of technology. So, so one example from the space domain, go back 10 years ago. So it's the summer of 2012. And I say to you, hey, we're going to land a rocket on a drone ship or back at the launch pad. That sounds like utter crazy talk in 2012. In 2015, yeah. that happens. And now it is routine. And if, if, that, if that rocket doesn't land, we are wondering what happened because they've done it 100 times. And why can't they do it 101st? And, and so over a 10-year time scale, things can radically change. And so I think if we project ourselves 10 years in the future, I'm not a prognosticator, but I think we're going to be uh, thinking a lot more about uh, NASA being at the moon, uh, commercial industry, maybe uh, leveraging uh, resources from the moon, maybe even Mars. And human history says that when commercial uh, ventures take us to new places, that the military has had to follow to defend those capabilities from those who might try to hold them at risk. So we'll see what happens. And I hope that I hope maybe uh, space is different and, and maybe we'll have completely peaceful uh, operations uh, outside Earth's, um, Earth's orbit. But uh, that would be that would be a unique feature of human history if we're able to do that. Now, so I I I very much appreciate your vision of the 10 years, where might we be? And the idea of, of seeing commercial on the moon and seeing NASA exploring out to Mars. I, I, those are the things that, you know, for, for my generation, you know, I, I can remember the, the first step on the moon, but, but just barely. And, and to see where we've come from there is, is amazing. And, and I know, like, I, I look at what Elon Musk is doing and what, what, Bezos is doing and and the opportunity that you know I could maybe go into space as a civilian it's a little expensive right now but the concept that in 10 years there might be the opportunity to hang out in space even if it's two or three hours and see the limb of the earth and and all that the opportunity for that type of commercial adventures I it, it amazes me I mean I I even five years ago I could not have imagined that we would have the proliferated Leo constellations that were seen today, the changes in how, in, in how new space sensing is changing the way people think about how they view the earth. I just think it's amazing and fascinating. And, and it's, it's wonderful to see Space Force thinking about taking advantage of those commercial new things that are coming along. Yeah, those are two great examples, uh, Leslie. Uh, you know, one being the P. Leo constellation. Of course, some of that was attempted or at least thought about in the 90s and it didn't work. And so nope. uh, we kind of got into that valley of disappointment where nobody could see it happening. And now, you know, it's, it's happening uh, in spades. And then you mentioned uh, space tourism again. Uh, five years ago, maybe it was being talked about, but probably a lot of skepticism. Ten years ago, it was crazy talk. And now it is becoming the norm. So again, just highlights how fast things can indeed change. Uh, by the way, I, talking about uh, remembering the the moon uh, the moon landing, I, I was only one and a half, so I I remember some of the latter uh, Apollo landings, not the Apollo eleven. But it just so happened I was in Europe the summer of 2019 when the 50th anniversary was being celebrated. And that weekend, I I, I was in London on one side of it, and then I was in Paris on the day of and the day after. The amount of excitement in those capitals for the 50th anniversary of the, the lunar landing was palpable. I saw so many NASA t-shirts. Uh, there was a, a, you know, big parties everywhere. And, and it just highlights the entire world. And these are our allies, of course, but the entire world is galvanized by what's happening in space. And, and it's exciting to be a part of that now in the second golden age, uh, 50 years later. Yeah. So, so I think space is one of those things that pulls people together because you, you know what the, the challenges are to get there and, and seeing mankind there is, is just exciting to people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I, and I think historically people want to defend that, that safe space, but they also want it to be available for all. And that, that requires that, that we have the Space Force and that we have those opportunities to work with our international partners and others to secure that space for commercial and for, you know, for national purposes. Uh, that, it, was very, that was very well said. I could repeat it all, but I will just you know, uh, say ditto. Thank you. Um, so uh, pivoting a little bit maybe to, to a, a different perspective on the world, um, 
or on space a little bit away from from some of the changes that are going on, although it's related. His, historically, we've really looked at space from a missionary perspective. We've looked at P, you know, position navigation and timing with GPS. We look at sensing with missile warning, missile tracking. We look at SATCOM. And we've actually bought and operated those things very independently and, and almost in silos. You mentioned earlier about um, cyber integration. You also mentioned things about Intel integration. And, and again, it's kind of along the lines of the mission areas, but there are opportunities for more integrated capabilities. And, and how is Spock thinking about how you organize and develop maybe new operational capabilities that aren't already in those silos as a way to think about more integrated effects? Yeah, as a foundation to answering that question, I'll highlight that in our uh, Space Force Doctrine document that we call the Space Capstone publication that we published in the summer of 2020 as a, as a first expression of what it means to be a space force and what space power means to the nation, we lay out three cornerstone responsibilities for the space force. The number one uh, cornerstone responsibility is to preserve freedom of action in space uh, for the nation so that we can take advantage of all that space has to offer. Number two cornerstone responsibility, the second cornerstone responsibility is that we enable joint lethality and effectiveness, which has really been our our historic mission, going back all the missions that you highlight, it's the things we've always provided the joint force and that the joint force is utterly reliant on today, like satellite communications, PNT, uh, weather from space, missile warning. And then our third uh, cornerstone responsibility is to provide independent options to the nation, which every service does. Uh, and you do that through your service chief, who's a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and a statutory military advisor to the president and secretary of defense. I go through that to say, we believe it's our moral responsibility to continue to support the joint force and enable their lethality and effectiveness through these missions that you highlighted. But that is becoming much harder now because of the threats we face. And so we now have to preserve and create the freedom of action on orbit so that we can continue to provide the missions that, that you've highlighted. And to do that, we now have to force package the capabilities, going back to what I previously referenced. So mm -hmm. we can't just count on a, a large, expensive uh, satellite communication satellite or, or military communication satellite to, to be successful today because there are threats now. The Russians and the Chinese have studied how we operate and they've created systems to hold us at risk. So now we have to think about, okay, how do we bring together all of our capabilities? led by intelligence, uh, with, with cyber defenses, uh, with command and control, uh, with uh, offense, defense, with joint fires, all coming together to, to make sure that we can neutralize threats and we can continue to operate in the face of those threats. That is the work of the Space Force and, and US Space Command now. And, and we're training that way. We're developing new uh, training exercises through Space Training and Readiness Command. Uh, we're working concepts of operations. Uh, all, all of that is working together uh, to make sure that we can operate in the face of these threats. And again, the reason we do all of that is because we have this moral responsibility to the rest of the joint force to give them the, the space effects that they have become reliant on. Now, so I, I appreciate your referencing back to the force packaging, because I think that that's a concept that the, the Air Force has used. And, and it really goes back to, in some ways, creating a center of grab or not a, or a critical mass in from a war fighting doctrine. And I'm, you know, I'm I'm out of date on some of my air war college days, et cetera. But but, you know, it goes back to that idea of creating enough mass and, and enough agility that, that you can win on the battlefield and, and bringing that to the, the space world is really helping us participate more completely, I think, in the joint forces and in, in the joint fight. And, and so it's exciting to see new words and terminology coming into space that haven't been there in the past, and especially in the concept of more integrated effects as a force package. So, you know, thank you for, for those observations and, and that, that concept coming forward. Yeah, and uh, you know, one of the things we're really excited about with our new guardians, uh, of course, we have a lot of us started out in the Air Force, and there's uh, great things we've learned from from that uh, experience and th that history that we have. But we are bringing in hundreds of new guardians from the Army, the Navy, and the Marines, and they're yeah. bringing us new and different ways of thinking as well. And uh, and and so we're excited to to help build this this new service, this new culture, these new ways of operating, uh, leveraging their experiences uh, also. 
Now that, that, as you said, it's really exciting. So, so the other thing that's going on in, in your world is people are starting to think about new orbital regimes for what were traditionally done maybe at GEO and MEO. Um, there's also new opportunities to think about how do you, you know, how do you think about being on orbit? Do you service on orbit? Do you, you know, do, do you completely wholesale replace constellations or do you think more about evolutionary? And, and many of this is also looking at leveraging commercial and allies, trying to pull in the, the ally capabilities that are out there. So I, how is Spock thinking about those changes going on in, in the world and, and thinking about what do you do with, you have mentioned cislunar or between the, you know, Earth's geostationary or geo orbit out to the moon. You mentioned that, but, but in general, how are you thinking about all the new orbital regimes and the new partnering that can be done? Yeah, uh, you know, PLEO and uh, some other orbital regimes are now starting to be uh, leveraged by commercial industry. And we're seeing, hey, this is opening up uh, new ways for us to operate. And I think you're seeing that now moving forward in our, some of our hybrid um, architectures and force designs that uh, that will lead to future systems that we're leveraging those uh, capabilities. Of course, the Space Development Agency will move into the Space Force uh, here at the end of this fiscal year, beginning of next fiscal year, and uh, they're they're developing systems to leverage PLEO and some of those more commercial style uh, satellite capabilities and and price points and and um, and um, upgrade cycles that we see in in some of the PLEO constellations. So we absolutely want to leverage that. I think we see commercial le uh, leading uh, on on-orbit servicing as well, and that will open up new opportunities uh, for us uh, with our satellite constellation. So very excited about uh, all that that has to offer. And then let me pivot over and talk about uh, our allies. Um, space has always been a team sport. No one country, no one organization can execute all the missions that, that need executing. And I actually think it's a real core competency of ours is, is teaming with our international partners. Now, that's not to say we've got everything figured out. It's a it's a ultra marathon every day, just showing up, working hard to try to continue to, to work better with our allies and break down uh, barriers. But with our closest allies, for example, Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom, we've been operating with them for decades. And we're at the point now where we have crew members in each other's op centers. We have um, international staff members on my staff. For example, I have a Canadian one star who's one of my deputy commanding generals. Um, we have a named operation through US Space Command that we execute with those three countries uh, on orbit, uh, Operation Olympic Defender. And then we have other really key partners as well, countries like France and Germany and Japan, uh, where we've traded liaison officers. We're working together on sharing data at the machine to machine level. Uh, in some cases, working uh, some um, uh, you know, early requirements together and, and looking at how we can partner. Uh, countries like Norway, where we're working with them on a satellite um, uh, hosted payload to fly on one of their satellites. I mean, just really exciting opportunities. And then there's other countries that definitely want to partner with us as well. And, and we kind of have a path now where they can send a, a liaison officer to Vandenberg to sit alongside us and other liaison officers and figure out how we can more closely partner together as we move forward. You know, we like to say we're, we're better together, uh, safer together. And, and this is a really distinguishing feature of uh, the United States and our Western uh, system and our allies is that uh, Russia and China don't have these kind of uh, relationships and, and they definitely do make us better. And we appreciate all that our allies uh, bring, uh, you know, to, to assist us, but also in their own right that we can leverage from them. So I, you know, I have observed firsthand many of those international partnerships coming from the NELSATCOM community, wideband gap or wideband global system. I still remember wideband gap filler, sorry, um, but wideband global service and then um, advanced JHF. Both of those have significant partnering with international partners. And I've been to many of the international meetings where they talk about that and, and how they're splitting funding as well as how we are able to allocate the capability on orbit across multiple nations. So it's exciting. And I we see the same thing in weather. And then going forward, I know there are opportunities with, with other international partners. But I find what I really find most fascinating is the idea of the international partners in the, the center at Vandenberg. And, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, were there transients with starting up with that? And how do you see that going forward? Do you see it expanding significantly for the coalition presence outside of maybe your staff? and outside of the, the one center at Vandenberg? 
Yeah, Vandenberg certainly is a, is an incredible location. You know, any given day out there, General Burt is executing her mission as the Combined Force Space Component Commander, and her her C2 center, her command and control center is the Combined Space Operations Center, or CSPOC. Uh, any given day, the major that is leading that uh, operation uh, might be an American, might be an Australian, might be a Canadian, might be a, a British officer, and they're all, uh, you know, integrated fully in that operation, conducting those missions. Um, you know, if you go up to Buckley, our missile warning location up there, you will find similarly those same countries fully integrated on our ops floor. If you go to our missile warning radars, where I got my start at Cape Cod and where I commanded at Clear, uh, Alaska, uh, we've had Canadians on those ops floors for decades. In fact, uh, Second Lieutenant Whiting, uh, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, the first non-commissioned officer I ever supervised was a Canadian non-commissioned officer. And, and so we see that in our in our SATCOM um, enterprise. In fact, as the Army enterprise moves over to us in August, uh, we'll be inheriting Australian partnerships where they sit on the ops floors of some of those ops centers. So just, uh, just awesome, uh, you know, uh, partnerships. And I think those will only grow going forward. Uh, we now have a, a liaison officer uh, in Paris working alongside the, the French Space Force. Uh, we'll just see those continue to grow as we all know that we're better operating together. So th those are more active international partners and more locations than I was aware of. And I'm sure some of that was a surprise to our audience. So I, I, I really appreciate those insights. Thank you. So, so a, a little bit of a, a slightly different question. So uh, you're the, both the SPOC commander and the US Space Force Service Component Commander to the US Space Command, that's a lot of commands. I hope I got all those right. Um, so in those, you know, with those two hats on, what is it that keeps you up at night? Yeah, and let me just talk a little bit about that relationship with uh, US Space Command. Of course, we are a service component uh, to US Space Command. General Dickinson is my operational boss. He has a service component from each of the other services as well. In fact, uh, your audience might, might find this a little bit humorous, but uh, the Air Force has now given him a service component. It's first Air Force down at Tyndall. They are fantastic teammates. And inside the US Space Command family now, they're, they're known as App Space. Uh, of course, they're a different App Space than the old Air Force Space Command, but that term uh, now has been repurposed for the uh, the Air Force component, and they're great teammates. Uh, but the thing that that keeps me up at most, uh, the mo at night, the most is the threat. Uh, that is why we have all been created in these new organizations, and that is what we have to show up to work to think about each and every day. Uh, it would be fantastic if, in the near future, we find ourselves with with countries no longer building threat systems to try to hold our space capabilities at risk. Uh, that does not seem to be the trend that we're on. So we have to, to build uh, resilient architectures and capabilities that allow us to operate in the face of those threats. Uh, by doing so, of course, we hope we, we deter uh, any other actor from taking hostile action uh, because we want space to remain free and peaceful and we want all of humanity to be able to leverage the benefits that are derived from space because there is so much uh, that we all derive from space. Um, but that is, that's what we th we're thinking about every day. And if I do wake up in the middle of the night, uh, that's, that's probably what I'm thinking about. No, that, thank you for that. I think the, the thread has changed. I, as you said, we kind of went through 17 years where there wasn't much of one, hands get big. Um, but but now, now it's certainly something that we need to take about. But my next question is, is really along the lines of that deterrence, which you'd mentioned. Are there, what do you think are the key st steps that we should be taking today to increase deterrence and avoid a war that might extend into space? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of policy work on deterrence and, and your audience uh, will, will probably be much better versed in all the nuances of deterrence than I am. But I think the classical elements of deterrence still hold uh, in space and, and across uh, all domains as we think about integrated deterrence. But it's about having capabilities that allow us to deny benefits to uh, other actors if they choose to attack us. They attack us for a reason. And if we can deny those benefits, uh, that's, that's leg one. Leg two is we have capabilities that allow us to hold them at risk. And then leg three is that we can clearly communicate that uh, to them. And, and that's, I think, how we create deterrence. Um, and so again, this is the entire purpose of having a space force, having a space command is to have organizations on the service side thinking about how we organize, train, and equip the forces uh, that provide the lion's share of that operational capability for U.S. Space Command. Uh, thinking about that from how we build our guardians to how we build our systems to how we build our TTPs um, and, and, and constantly evolving and improving that. 
And then on the U.S. Space Command side, uh, thinking about the concepts of operations and the, the plans uh, that are needed uh, to, to make sure we're ready in case there is a uh, conflict that starts in or extends into space. And so uh, maturing those organizations, uh, making sure that we're getting after the, the core reason we've been created, I think all of that goes to producing and, and creating uh, deterrence uh, in, in space, but also uh, in other domains as well. So I think your comment on maturing those organizations and, and I think maturing also the communication to the broader community, both congressional, the public policymakers, you, you hit on, on multiple things in, in your answer. And I think, as you said, all of those together can create a deterrence, even the fact that we're able to share more things because what, you, what our enemies, our adversaries don't know about it's harder for those to be deterrent. And so the changes in how we discuss some of our, our defensive capabilities and others ha has been, I think, a, a, a welcome change and, and exciting to see. Um, and, and so I'm, I, I look forward to seeing how that evolves and how the maturation changes, how we think about, about space and space defense and deterrence. Yeah, in, indeed. And if I could add one more thought on deterrence, you know, uh, we definitely are fully supportive of uh, Secretary Austin and the DOD and administration's uh, push on integrated deterrence. And, and we believe space is the eyes and ears of that integrated deterrence, because in space, we can overfly any location on the earth um, legally. And so we can look over that next hill, that next mountain to see what's happening there and to provide strategic warning for the nation, uh, whether that's intelligence or whether that's missile warning, space gives us that advantage. And then from space, we network the whole joint force together uh, in a way that truly makes integrated deterrence global. Certainly, it takes all the other elements of, uh, of the DOD and national power to create true deterrence for the nation. But we think that's our that's our unique role is to be that eyes and ears and then to be the uh, connectivity that makes it global. No, I, I, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more on the eyes and ears for our nation. So, so sir, we have our, a wide audience across the U.S. and global space community that watches this. Are there any challenges that you want to throw out to our audience and invite them to, to look at all of the challenges facing space from a national space perspective for you know, commercial, military, civil, what, any challenges that you want to throw out from a policy perspective that you'd like this audience to chew on and think about? Well, uh, y'all are doing great work because there's a lot to, to work on. And so thank you to those across the uh, policy uh, community who are, who are doing that work. I'll highlight two, and these aren't necessarily the top two, it's just two that have been on my mind uh, recently. Um, you know, cybersecurity and how we measure risk in the cyber domain is a real issue, and it's some issue that we've, we've asked for and gotten some help on from the policy community. But, but let me contrast how we think about cybersecurity with how we think about physical security. So here at Peterson Space Force Base, we have a fence around our, our, our installation. We have an armed force of security forces members who are well-trained in how to defend this installation. We have uh, security uh, cameras. We have security alarms. All of that coming together, we're pretty comfortable understanding what our security posture is relative to the threat outside the gate uh, based on intelligence and, and law enforcement and things that are going on there. Now contrast that with cybersecurity where we know there are countries that are trying to probe us in cyber, what we call ad advanced uh, persistent threat actors. Um, we don't have a similar feel for how to measure our risk in cyber. We've invested in, in cybersecurity. We've invested in cyber defenses. We have a cyber workforce who is thinking about defensive cyber, but how do you measure that cyber risk in a way that you can come to a decision on, um, okay, I'm comfortable with my risk posture because right now, uh, frankly, we're all just very worried about cyber and, and we, we're, we're struggling with how to measure that. We've gotten some help, we're making some progress, but there's a lot more work there on how we measure uh, cyber risk. And then I'll just highlight the international discussion we had earlier. I mentioned it's an interna uh, pardon me, it's a, uh, it's an ultra marathon. You're never going to get to the end state of improving our ability to work with our allies. Uh, but you know, how do we, how do we bake in cooperation from the beginning with our, with our allies, instead of thinking about it late in the game with a new acquisition or a new, new policy decision, how are we always constantly evaluating uh, to improve our ability to coordinate with uh, uh, other countries that are that are friendly to us. Um, that's there's a lot of policy issues there that uh, that that we you know solicit uh, any help on as people are thinking about that problem. 
So I, I found the first one, both, both of those are fascinating challenges and, and they, they come with so many dimensions. The, the cyber risk is, as you said, we're all worried about cyber. Um, ways to measure it are a challenge and, and that is a great, great nugget for people to chew on because we do tend, it, it, it's kind of like communications, everybody wants more, but you have to be able to measure what's enough. And, and, and we have over decades developed ways to measure that. And as you said, develop ways to measure physical security. I, I've not, and I've worked cyber previously, I, I've not really seen us uh, assess that well and come up with good metrics for it. And so I appreciate that challenge. The international partnership, I love your reference to it as an ultra marathon be, because there's so much that can go on there. And as the world changes and more and more actors come into space, there are you know, multiple developing countries are, are launching satellites. And so seeing how they will come into place and how to, you know, into space and how Space Force and our nation can take advantage of that and help them. Um, I, I think those are really fascinating. And I know there are policy challenges there. So I, I, I love those too, because they're, they're, they're so global and yet so critical to the space mission that, that you are responsible for. Um, so, sir, we're, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, it has been a delight to chat with you. Is there anything else that, that you'd like to say to our audience before we wrap up here? Hey, thanks, Leslie. I've really enjoyed the discussion. You know, I'll just highlight uh, the Space Force is two and a half years old. Uh, we're the terrible twos bouncing off the walls, trying to, you know, make things better as we move fast and, and try not to break too many things. Uh, but we really just appreciate the support of the uh, American people and certainly of this community um, as, as we're striving to move forward. I tell you, we're a very small force um, under, well, right around 8,000, um, building to right around 8,000 uniform guardians, about that many civilians. Uh, of course, we recognize that we have a lot of stakeholders out there, commercial industry that supports us, FFRDCs, uh, but, but we're a small organization and we're going to have to punch way above our weight as we move forward um, to, to do the things that the nation needs us to do. And I think we're on a good path, but a lot of work left to be done. And, and we look forward to partnering across this community uh, to, to keep making that progress. So, so watching you and the other leaders within the Space Force, I, I have significant confidence that, that you are punching above your weight. And I wish you the best of success going forward. And again, I thank you so much for joining the Aerospace Space, Pol Space Policy Show. You have a great day, sir. Thanks, Leslie. You as well. Wow. I think I'll have to watch this episode again. So much to digest there. All exciting stuff from Lieutenant General Whiting. Thanks so much. We learned all about the Space Force readiness and what to expect from the future. That's my reminder to viewers also. All shows are available to watch again and again and again. Um, so by this time tomorrow, the podcast will be released. Subscribe either to your favorite podcast platform or our newsletter to get notifications about new episodes. And our expert, Leslie Blackham, really knows her stuff. Thanks very much, Leslie, for leading that great discussion. And today's episode builds on what we've already produced here at the show, on the design and future of the US Space Force, talking to many leaders across the nation. So be sure to check out our previous episodes on our National Security Space Collection at csps.aerospace.org slash space policy show. James Liggins is our technical director. Jordan Bingham is our program coordinator. Thanks for watching.